What's happening, everyone? Welcome back to the Water Ski Podcast, uh, the podcast that aims to promote and grow the sport of water skiing. Sorry for the long break. Generally, I am posting weekly. However, I haven't been able to post in a few weeks. Luckily, because I've been super busy in doing skiing-related things, uh, primarily coaching, a lot of skiing myself as well, luckily. And... Um, yeah, so sorry for the long break, but I have an interview here that I think you guys are thoroughly going to enjoy. This episode is with Jeff Serge. Jeff Serge is the president of the National Collegiate Water Ski Association in the United States and also the president of the American Water Ski Association. He's a great skier as well, great overall skier, tournament organizer, and straight down a super cool dude um as i say in the interview i met him through ncwsa's but certainly always struck me as someone very passionate very serious uh but fueled maybe by the right energy that should fuel people with position of um influence in the sport to have those positions and that's what we talk about in this podcast uh obviously his upbringing, his growth as a skier, his collegiate experience, and how right around that time he started to take on more and more voluntary positions um, as a volunteer to help out the sport in his area and eventually on a broader scale nationwide. So I really hope you enjoy this. You will enjoy this interview. This interview is brought to you by the Flow Point Method. By now you should know the flow point method is a great holistic approach into water skiing that you can join and become better um, straight up. Like it covers nutrition, mindset, uh, slalom techniques, slalom strategy, uh, strength and conditioning, maintenance of a healthy body. And this week, rather than telling you what this is all about, I have one of the two founders, so not Jenny, but Marcus Brown, telling you a little bit about what the Flowpoint Method is all about. You know, I think we sometimes forget that improving as a skier will take effort. Yeah, it's true that time on the water makes a big difference, but there really isn't ever a quick fix or a tip that changes everything for good. There isn't a magic bullet. Intuitively, we know that it all comes down to you and your desire to actually reach your potential. That's where it starts. You've got to want it. And if you truly do, you will have to improve your understanding of a few key components like nutrition, ski specific fitness, sports psychology, tournament prep, and water ski theory. You'll need these specific tools if you want to reach the ultimate version of yourself on the water. So if someday that is in fact your goal, then what are you waiting for? Why aren't you starting right now? Accept the challenge, put in the work, and become the skier you never thought you could be. We get it. Life's short. So that's why we created the Flow Point Method, to help guide you on your journey to being the best skier you know you could be. Oh, and we also give you some pretty sweet discounts if you become a part of the program. You know, like $600 off the all-new 2021 Syndicate Pro or the Tried and True Omega. Just saying. So there you go. You heard it from the man. If you want to sign up for the flow point method, you can do so by going to the waterskipodcast.com slash flow point method. One word again, the waterskipodcast.com slash flow point method. Enough with the introduction. Here's the interview with Jeff. Stick around because right around midway through the episode, uh, I have an announcement for all the listeners. I think something that you guys are going to thoroughly enjoy. You good to go? Yep. Let's do it. Jeff, welcome to the Water Ski Podcast, man. Glad to have you here. Thanks for having me, Mateo. How's uh, everything going? 
It's going well. It's going well. Uh, ski school is busy. A lot of skiing. Um, not so much on my side, but it's going well. How's it going with you? Uh, good. I mean, obviously, been a pretty interesting summer on and off the water with everything going on, as it is for everybody. So just uh, getting through every day by day and getting dealing with COVID at work and water ski life. And but it's going good. OK. OK. Yeah, it's uh, challenging times for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, what are you, what are we, so we're doing this on Skype. Uh, where are you talking from? Uh, I'm at home in, uh, about an hour south of Chicago, uh, where we, we ski and everything and here in Wilmington, Illinois. Looks sunny. Has it been good weather? You know, it's been pretty decent. We've actually had a pretty hot summer, so. Nice. Nice. Have you been skiing? Uh, so I've actually, uh, taken the year off from competing for the first time in, my career, you know, outside of injury. Um, so it's been, it's been different. It's, uh, going into the year, I, I had to work uh, a lot longer and more than I usually do because of COVID in our business. So got up to a really late start of the season. We have such a short season here in the Midwest to begin with. So if you, you chop a month off the beginning of that, it uh, gets tough. So, uh, you know, decided, uh, in the beginning of the year, I was going to take a year off. I got a, a baby coming, first child coming in September, um, and a really big year next year with us hosting Rio's and Nationals. So I just kind of needed a year off. I really wanted to, to practice um, more than compete. Uh, every year I competing, it feels, you know, you get in that tournament mode where, you know, you want to work on tricks, but I got to get my run down for the weekend. I want to try a fin change, but, you know, I, I don't want to mess it up for the weekend. And I just wanted to take a year to, to work on flips and, and try a bunch of ski settings. And so I just took the year off from competing. I'm still going to all the tournaments and, uh, bringing the boat and judging, but it's it's been it's been fun actually. The the lack of pressure and that you put on yourself every day in a tournament. So it's it's uh, so I'm skiing, you know, somewhat nowhere near what I usually do, but uh, not competing this year. Interesting, interesting. It's interesting that it's by choice because, as you probably know, a lot of countries here in Europe, like it's not even a choice. You there's no competition yet. Uh, some some European countries do have competitions, but some like Italy, for instance, hasn't had a competition this year. So no, interesting. Speaking of competitions, obviously we're already alluding to the fact that you're a competitive skier and and if I may say a quite high of a level competitive water <laughs> skier. Um, where did it all start? How did you get into the sport? Uh, so my uh, my mom, my stepmom skied. Uh, my dad met her you know, back in, back in the eighties. So, you know, as soon as that happened, you know, we got involved in the sport right away. My dad got really interested in it, bought a boat, did all that stuff. So she really introduced us to it. So took it up, you know, right away as, as like all the kids do. Um, so yeah, I was introduced to it right away just through family and, and friends and grew up on a, a site in the summers. We would go camp uh, out here and they had a course and everybody was skiing. So I was involved in it right away. Yeah. Uh, how old were you when you started? I was I was older than than most. I mean, I started skiing when I was seven. I didn't like it, you know, like a lot of kids. Parents threw the toys in the water. I didn't care, type thing. I mean, I didn't ski my first tournament till I was twelve. Uh, didn't uh, qualify for nationals till uh, my last year in boys three. Uh, didn't jump over a hundred till my last year in college. So I was I was a late bloomer, you know, all things considered. But uh, you know, I did it early on. I just never was good. Never really got into it until you know, I was a late teenager. Interesting, interesting story because that's actually when a lot of kids stop, right? Like I, I'm, yeah. I, I want to bet, and I, I know of personal, like personally, of stories of late bloomers, shall we say, that never got to bloom almost, you know, like they said, okay, well, this is not for me. There's a lot of other skiers that are better than me, and I'll, I'll get into something else. Um, what made you stick around? What what has it been about skiing? Well, uh, you know, it's a, all your friends are doing it. You know that you know it's a lot of fun in tournaments. I, I but I think in the end, when you start getting better, that's really the hook. You know, when I you know went down to Be, uh, Benzel's ski school, that was kind of my first taste of like, ooh, you know, uh, what everybody's out there doing because we kind of grew up in a small community and just had local tournaments. Never really went to outside tournaments, so I went down to Benzel's for a couple weeks you know, just learned what slalom was all about with the hips up and came back right. and everybody, everybody at home was like, Oh, that's pretty interesting technique. So I, I did start improving rather quick. And, 
we grew up where we grew up there wasn't a jump yeah mm-hmm. so we would just jump at tournaments it, you know it was a nice place to ski but it had railroad tides on the side so you know a lot of bad conditions so what really probably catapulted my involvement in just staying in it is in 1995 my dad bought a farm and dug a couple lakes because uh, he wanted to have a place for us to, to train and have a jump and uh, have a nice condition so he he dug a two lake site here at home in 96 and you know once we had that you know just started skiing and i i, I went to core it's kind of funny i I went down to Benzel's and uh, they didn't really care about tricks as much. <laughs> or I don't want to say they didn't care about tricks, but, you know, it was one of those ski schools where you just didn't have a lot of trick coaching. So I tried Corey Picos's ski school the next year and mm-hmm. uh, just really fell in love with that place. And Corey and Rose are, you know, really good friends now. So I, every summer I would go there and work and uh, so learned a lot there, uh, just coaching and being in the boat. And just, you know, skiing started to improve enough that uh, it was hooked for life. So if my memory doesn't fail me, I'm trying to think back from my interview with Adam and Corey. Mid-90s, so they were already in Santa Rosa when you when you went to the first time? Yes, they were. Okay. Well, I can see how you fell in love with the place. <laughs> um, nice. And so you threw in college. Now, did you ski in college? What was dead like yeah i skied for purdue university uh yeah. over in indiana um i was uh you know once again i was kind of not at a level of getting a scholarship or anything like that i so i was going to go into pharmacy school so it was three schools at the time that had both the ski team and pharmacy one of them was ucf um i actually got a, a scholarship to to go there but it was only undergrad i didn't really want to move colleges once i got to to the graduate program of pharmacy so i kind of threw out the door there. And then, uh, so it was kind of between Kansas and Purdue. And uh, we were actually with my dad. Uh, we had already visited Purdue. We were on, on the ride to the airport. And I just looked at him and I said, why are we even taking this trip? I love Purdue. It was a couple hours. So it was away from home, but it wasn't too far. So we turned around. We never took the flight to go visit Kansas and decided to ski, ski for Purdue and the pharmacy and um, everything I wanted. So that's, I skied for Purdue and, uh, really enjoyed it there was a lot of fun so uh, wow that's that's pretty bold like you were you already at the airport you just did a turnaround or yeah we were on the way and i don't even i i don't know i just uh, i just looked at them and said what what what's kansas gonna have that purdue didn't have and and i probably would have loved kansas too but you know they're very similar had a ski team no scholarships both had pharmacy and one was 10 hours away one was two and uh just you know decided I wanted to be a little bit closer home so I could drive and come home and train on the weekends and stuff. Well, it's interesting because when you said three school, well, nowadays at least, the famous school that has pharmacy and has collegiate water skiing is UL Monroe. <laughs> that's a good point. You're right. They, uh, you want to talk about pharmacy and skiing. That's, that's the epic center of that. I mean, Regina studied pharmacy there. I, I think, it, you know, just at the time, I, I wasn't good enough. I was getting in the 28, 32 off, tricking 1,000 and jumping 90 feet. So I was not at any caliber to be, be on the Monroe's team at that time. I see. I see. Okay. And so you did undergraduate in Purdue and also your graduate studies in pharmacy there? Yeah, I did the whole pharmacy program there, six years. That's the same program that Kale came from, right? Afterwards, yep. obviously. Yep, yep. Yeah, with the Purdue Study Pharmacy as well. Wow. What is it with water skiers and, and pharmacy? I mean, Claudio Kostenberger, Regina, you, <laughs> Kale. That's, I mean, high-level skiers. Um, did you enjoy your studies? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I... To be honest, you know, going out of high school, I really did it just for the job placement. I had uh, a couple uncles that were pharmacists. I can't say I grew up dying to be a pharmacist. So at the time, I just kind of made a choice to have a good job, uh, good, good, you know, pay and job security. Um, I actually, uh, five years into it, I came home. Uh, mm-hmm. I told my dad that summer that I wanted to switch to construction. So I had grew, grew up. My dad was a painter. He was a uh, um, construction worker, uh, framing houses, he was a carpenter. And I did that so much with them. You know, I said five o'clock in the morning before high school, I was, you know, framing, framing houses with them. So I grew up kind of in the trades and it's just something I, 
you know, still love do. So at their five years of pharmacy school, I, they just said, you know, this this is not for me. It's, it's, it's doesn't seem like a career that I'm super excited about. So I almost made the switch and he just said, hey, do you really want to work, you know, in, in the cold winters and the hot summers outside? And, you know, he would have supported me, but I think he, you know, knew that the pharmacy might be a better choice for me in the long run. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and just judging from the tone in which you're saying it, it sounded that he was right at least. Yes, I think so. I, you know, I, I do still love it. I remodeled my whole, my house here. I, it, it is kind of a passion, but when you talk about, you know, a solid career and good pay and, you know, where it's taken me, yeah, no regrets. Okay. Okay. And so five years in, that would would have meant that you were done with skiing, correct? That is correct. Yes. In college. Yeah. Yes. In college. Yeah. I mean, collegiate skiing. What was collegiate water skiing for you? Like, what did it do to to you as a person, to you as a student, to you as a skier? Uh, honestly, everything. I mean, it just, you know, not only did it get me involved, you know, started my career in this all volunteer, you know, uh, out there, you know, getting involved uh, with the team and helping it grow and all that, you know, the, the Purdue itself, just what I learned you know, going to the campus, being in fraternity, uh, you know, to me, college is, is more about learning life than it is about books. Um, so, you know, college skiing was great. A lot of friends, you know, for me, you know, like I said, I wasn't very, it was decent skier growing up, but I, you know, I grew up around Freddie and, and all the, you know, Jamie Bouchains and, and everybody that was just so good. And obviously as a kid, you wish you would have started earlier. So it was, I mean, I'll, you know, not kidding to go to Purdue and kind of be a big fish in a small pond as opposed to small fish in a, in a big pond was, it was great for me. It was, you know, great for my career. It was, a, I was a very good Midwest skier in college. So, you know, that was, it was nice to enjoy that. Um, but yeah, college skiing, I mean, that the friendships you have from that, you still some of your, your best friends that are in your weddings. And uh, I mean, you, you've skied college, anybody who's done it is, it's the best four years of your life. It's, yeah. It's, I was just going to say, I was just going to say now, um, I've never been up there because, as you know, I skied for UL Lafayette, and so I, n- I don't recall doing tournaments in the Midwest. Give me a, and, and I know I've never been to Purdue. What was the the setup like? Was the lake close to campus? How were you guys organized? It varied from year to year. I mean, yeah, we did not have a solid place to train. I, you know, and I think my freshman year, I traveled to some three event AWSA sites that I knew were close by. We didn't have a place on campus. Uh, by the time I graduated, I don't even know if I had one. I think by my senior year, we had found uh, it was a peat moss farm. It was disgusting, uh, dirty. But you know, we finally got a course in there and kind of had uh, a place to go. Um, but you, you, you just didn't train a lot. You, you didn't have time to come home, so you really just uh, skied in tournaments for the most part. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Did it change after you left? Do, do you know if Purdue now has a solid site or how do how do are they organized? Yeah, they, you know, nothing is super close for them, but I think within 20 minutes, they, they've had about two or three different sites now. I think they have a jump now. So they have a much better uh, training facility uh, when I was there. You know, nothing, nothing like Monroe where you walk out your dorm and ski, but not a lot of people have that. But they, they have places close by they can go. Okay. No, that's good. That's good. Uh, because I think that's, that's, I mean, at least one of my f- – fondest memories and one of the reasons why I say those were the best four years of my life was that the skiers are the classmates, the classmates are the roommates. I mean, it becomes really a family, right? And certainly part of it is that you go and ski together. I mean, possibly in between classes, if you are in places like Monroe or Lafayette or Clemson or, you know, where the lake is right there. Um, But certainly even after school. Um, Did you improve a lot as a skier while you were there? I, uh, I did, you know, for as little training I had, and maybe it was more from the summers, you know, coming home and, you know, going to Corey's for a few months and then coming home and having a, a beautiful place here to train every day. I definitely, those four years, I, you know, went from 80 feet and jumped to 130 and was getting into 38 off. So I definitely improved, you know, during those times. And, it, you know, going back to what you just said there, I think it's that team aspect. You know, there's just something about skiing for a team instead of yourself, which is what water skiing mostly is just 
I, I, the excitement you get from that, the pressure, the competition, I, I just think that's what makes college skiing so great. Yeah, it's, it, it truly is the only um, venue of water skiing where you're skiing for the team because even – I mean, I've skied Worlds, Europeans, they have a team ranking at the end, but it's not the same. You're there to ski for yourself. Whereas collegiate skiing, you're there to ski for the team. And should you rack up a couple of medals for yourself, that's just like cherish on the top. But exactly, it's, yeah. it's just like almost, all, I don't want to say irrelevant, but very, very minimal in terms of importance. Um how how did you do in those four years? Did you guys make it to Division One? Like, how was Purdue team during your stay? We we were good. So at the time, Matteo, we actually did not have two divisions. That started in about two thousand three or four. So at that okay. time, you had to place top two at your regionals, which was which was hard to do. So we made it my freshman year. Uh, we did not make it my sophomore year uh, because I. Uh, I'll tell you that story, but that's one of my biggest regrets in skiing. Uh, we did not make it my sophomore year, and then we made it my junior year, and in senior year, we hosted nationals, and we made it then. So we made it three out of four years, top two in the region. So Purdue was a powerhouse in the Midwest at that time. Which I'm assuming already at the time it was the biggest region in terms of teams? Yeah, it always was. I mean, it still is now, and it just, I mean, it's always been that way. I don't know why or how uh because really i mean it's cold up there you would think that florida should have 20 teams it's uh just midwest has always been uh, had a lot of water ski teams and been a big region okay okay well you can't leave me hanging for too long what's the sophomore <laughs> year story so yeah sophomore year you know i was i was the star in the team i mean i was worth you know all the points for the not all the points but you know it was i was the top rotation skier in each each event and we got to Decatur Illinois the pits where where Freddie grew up uh, they hosted the regionals and it was white cap and I mean you know 20 30 mile an hour winds but it was one of those where you you couldn't tell from the dock how bad it was mm -hmm. you know because it was blowing the other way and nobody had made ba barely anybody had made an opener and nobody I mean I think four and 15 off was winning at the time and I started at 22 off um, right. so, uh, I think my dad was driving, you know, you know, we kind of, you know, you know, the judges then and they kept, every time they came to the dock, he kept looking at me and going, it's, it's windier than you think. So, you know, in hindsight, maybe I should have started, you know, in an earlier pass, but you know, it is, you're used to starting what you start at and you think how bad could it be? It's my opener. So I started at 36, 22, uh, fell around two ball, you know, and, and finished in that last spot. I mean, that's, that's six, 700 team points. You know, when you have that many teams at the regionals in the Midwest, those, those, you know, the top. So I didn't need to win it or anything. I just had to run my opener and we make it to nationals. And I obviously didn't. And God, that, you know, it, it's the good and bad of skiing for a team, right? I mean, you, the pressure's on you. So when you, you're a hero, when you do good, but uh, when you, when you choke like that. So it, it kind of cost us a trip to nationals. So it was, it was devastating at the time. And I still think about it. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> really? Yeah, it's one of those things. I don't know if you heard the interview that I had with Will, but he had a similar experience, although opposite in terms of like he started too long of a line at his junior worlds and fell first pass. And yeah. I think those are some of those experiences that really leave a mark, you know? Like, I mean, for him to tell me two months ago in our interview about junior worlds, however long that was, or for you to tell me about this episode, it, they, they leave a mark, you know, like, and I think we learn from them, hopefully, you know. I think that's what's so unique about our sport, which makes it so hard, is it's such a one-time shot. I, I, I compare it to maybe gymnastics, and I don't know too many other sports. I mean, hey, if LeBron James has a bad quarter, he can come back and, and have a better second half. Uh, snow ski jumpers, I feel like they get three or four jumps. I mean, uh, it's just, it's such a one-and-done sport that it's it's tough. Yeah, it is tough. So you better learn from the good and the bad quickly <laughs> and, and try to do your best the next time. Yeah, no, full, yeah, f fully agreed. Um, and so you made it. Uh, any individual success at collegiate nationals for you? Any, any collegiate nationals that you remember doing well or you have a fond memory about? I would think for sure it would be... Uh, Placing six, oddly enough, at 
the, the nationals we hosted. Uh, I, you know, we, we worked so hard to put that nationals together. I mean, we didn't sleep for, for weeks. I don't think I went to class until October because we, we bid on nationals before the lake was even dug. Um, so it was crunch time to get together. So to be hosting it and to ski good, you know, on your home site in front of, I mean, it was Jamie Bouchain, Chris Sullivan, Ronnie Barr. I mean, all the, all the names you grow up idolizing. And I ran, I mean, I only ran three of 35, but at that time, that's when two of 38 was winning nationals. So just to, to run 32, uh, make that money pass, so to speak, uh, get three of 35. I missed the podium by one, but I, that was one of my most, most memorable moments, I think for college. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there were other memorable moments that were outside of the skiing. And I'm not necessarily asking you to, to say something, you know, like compromising or anything, but I think that's also part of that experience of the four years of collegiate water skiing that, that adds to the package in a sense, you know, like you're, you're having so much fun with these people that you share so many experiences with that, you know, there, there's also the, the real fun. Um, now, why am I asking you all these questions about college? Because the first time I met you, you were the president of NCWSA. So the National Collegiate Water Ski Association in the US. Um, how did that come about? Like, how did you become, like, how did you get involved? How did it start? It was 1995. Uh, you know, I had already gotten involved in the Purdue team. You know, I think I was vice president at the time. I've just always been somebody, you know, who likes to help, likes to volunteer. I like to make things better. I don't like to sit back and, and complain. I'd rather be part of the solution. So it's always just been in my nature to, to kind of be involved. You know, if I'm at a tournament, I'm working. It's just how I grew up. It's how my parents, you know, made me. And so in 19... 1995, there was, you know, the time that the Midwest chairman at the time, you know, a lot of people wanted some turnover there. And I, I just decided to run for, for vice chairman of the Midwest region in 1995, which was pretty, pretty big step to go right up there. I wasn't on a committee or anything. And so ran for that at the meeting. And really, from there, it just, just took off, you know, before I know it, I was vice chairman. Uh, I think a couple of years later under Phil Chase, I just always had that, that, you know, want and drive to, to be involved in stuff. And I just enjoy it. I like to stay busy. I like to, I like that stuff, you know, a lot of people don't, but so yeah, 1985, I ran for, for vice chairman of the Midwest region under um, Shauna Miller. She was a chairman at the time and uh, just tried to start making a lot of changes. And I've been, I've been on the board ever since, the, uh, since 1995. So, on the board of uh okay of the mid of the region or national uh, of national so once you're each region has a chairman and a vice chairman so i was vice chairman in 1985 which put me on the national board as a midwest rep ah okay okay see that that's interesting because the way you phrased it um it seemed like you said there was need for a turnover and i'm assuming you have some ideas of one needed to change and then you decided to to make the step and i think in my although my experiences are different i always have the feeling that there's a lot of people that don't make that step right uh like they see something wrong they want to bring change about and whether because they don't want the time commitment they don't know how to bring about that change they never make make the step of raising their hand and say hey i, I like to give it a shot um because you've had several higher positions since then, was that the hardest step or were there steps along the way where you're like, wow, am I really considering that position now? Like a bit of, um, shall I say, hesitation? Uh, I would say the only, probably to answer that, the way you worded it would be the president of to say. That was probably the only decision that was, wow, do I really want to take this on? I. I got involved in Native USA very early, about the same time. Um, I was, we were hosting regionals. You know, I told you we, we hosted nationals when we had no lakes. Uh, two years later, we bid on Native USA regionals with one lake. So we had to get a second lake ready. That's kind of how my dad is too. You know, it's, <laughs> we, we want to have this tournament. We're going to, we're going to make it happen. We, we like to like to do that. So I obviously get a lot from them. Um, so I think it was the 1998 
regionals, uh, I was at the site getting ready. My dad went to the board meeting and there was a opening for skiers qualification committee at the time in the West. And he volunteered before it came home and said, Oh, by the way, you're, uh, you're on the skiers qualification committee. And uh, I was like, Oh, sh- uh, thank you. I guess uh, I'll do it. But, uh, so that's kind of how I got started in AWSA as well. Uh, kind of the same time. And before, I think two years later, I was chairman of skiers qualification, um, right away. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, there was never any hesitation in much of that. I wanted to be on the board of college. I wanted to be vice chairman. I want, you know, I kind of wanted to do all those steps. But President Ayer to say that was something I never even thought I would want to do until I decided to do it. That was that was the toughest one. And that was the most recent one, correct? Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. 2015. Okay. So let's backtrack a little bit. Uh, how long have you? Are you still president of NCWSA? I am. I and that has been 14 years, 14 years. <laughs> so 14 years, that's 2006. Six. Yeah, because my my first national was 2007. And you were already president. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. How did, did this one come up? Like there was an opening, there was change needed. What what brought that one about? It was very similar to, to kind of like the Midwest one. I, you know, I was vice chairman for five or six years. And Phil Chase was a great chairman, so I don't want to, you know, throw him under the bus or say he didn't do a good job. I mean, he's, you know, collegiate skiing is where it is today because I had Walker and, and Phil. You know, Phil came up with the two divisions. But it's kind of the same thing. You know, you, you're vice chairman and you're ready for that next role. You see things that maybe the chairman or president is doing that you think you could do better. And if you're not getting... If you're not seeing that change the way you see it, and, and you know, a lot of times it does come from a group. You know, you hear other board members, you know, maybe get aggravated or get frustrated, and I think that really inspires you too to to say, all right, there's it's not just me that sees this or wants to change. You know, it is everybody, and then I feel not obligated, but you know, maybe it's my my job and duty to take that next step and see what I can do. Not that I'll you know, be able to do it better, but I at least want to, to try that. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like a, I mean, almost a natural progression, but still with ideas, you know, like we, with things that you, you might want to see different or maybe progress in a different way or continue to do the way they were done run before. And you know that because you were involved, you can continue to do them that way. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. And, what would you say have been your biggest challenges at NCWSA in the last 14 years? Wow, interesting. Challenges, huh? Yeah, that's, those are the fun ones. Yeah. Um, I got to think about that. I mean, college has been, it's, it's been great. I'd be honest. I can't, you know, you're going to ask me the same question, but you say, and then I have a, a lot of answers for that one. Uh, oh, welcome. Co- welcome. Co- college. Uh, you know, you, you go through things, you go through things with, with trying to, you know, a lot of rule changes that people want, you know, dealing with eligibility and online schooling, uh, but nothing major. I mean, I hate, God, I, sh- I feel like I should have a better answer for this, but, um, that, I mean, it just runs itself to be honest. I mean, it's such a great atmosphere. And as long as that atmosphere stays that way, it's, it, it runs itself. I mean, yes, we've, you know, I do feel like, could we have 200 college teams out there? You know, I think there's still room for a tremendous amount of growth. Um, and I feel like we probably haven't taken on that challenge as much as we could. So I think that's more of a regret maybe I have. Um, and, you know, that's just maybe a time commitment. You know, everybody's so busy just trying to run their regions and run their teams to take it to that next level where you're really reaching out to a bunch of new campuses. But I, to me, I feel like there's a water skier in every campus. If you see how some of these teams get started, it's just one kid who, you know, might be a Wally and, and got started and, you know, you find somebody else on campus and they have the same interests and you get them to start the club. And before you know it, five years later, they got a full team, but it takes such a, you need people on campus to do that, that, we haven't really done that as an organization to, to really grow it more than I think we could, but we need more resources and time and, and money. But to be honest, yeah, not, I mean, not a ton of challenges in, in college, you know, you, you got a little stuff that comes up, but you, the board 
what the board of directors in college has just always been just amazing to me. I mean, I sit in the board meetings of college and I just, it blows me away every time of how open everybody is, how well they think about growing the sport. I mean, you have to balance the, the most grassroots skiers you can find, you know, people who can't even get the one ball and you got to balance. I mean, every single professional skier has gone through those ranks. You, Regina's, the Freddies. I mean, uh, you know, you talk about a broad range of ability levels. So, you know, to, to watch the board of directors really navigate all that and, and be able to, to, to maintain that has just been awesome. I mean, the board of directors for me has been, been great for college. They've made it easy for me. That's good. That's good. Um, because, yeah, my sense is, especially given how much collegiate skiing is growing, how even like, I don't know if, the, if it's pressure, but like there's a lot of very respect, respected people in the sport that hold collegiate water skiing as the continuous possibility for growth. And I think it's because it has shown it, right? Um, very important names. Some of them, I even I even interviewed them for the podcast. So I, I thought, you know, the pressure of having to manage all of this. But then again, it's very, you know, you have the regions, you have the teams, like there, there is a fairly cascade structure um, that it's very, I'm very happy to hear that it almost runs itself uh, because then it means that it's sustainable. Yes. Yeah. That the future of collegiate water skiing is, um, is, uh, is bright. Um, by the way, completely aside, I discovered, actually Corey told me this a few months ago, that Japan has a fairly, you know, populated collegiate water ski scene. Were you aware of this? Uh, not to the level that he experienced. I know, I think he was there uh, last year or something for some coaching after Worlds. Yeah. Um, I know it's probably the second con- biggest country or seems like it. They really get into it, though. I mean, it's yeah. got that same atmosphere that we have here in the States with grassroots skiers in the team atmosphere and uh yeah uh they they love it there yeah no it's 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 cool because i think it's a model that could work for other nations as well now granted that sports in college is a very american thing so i'm I'm comparing for instance to italy there's no sports in college you go to college to study and and that's it so probably here that model wouldn't work but i know that there's other countries that have sports in college where, you know, maybe, maybe a model like this would work. Yeah. I was blown away when Corey showed me those videos of students with drums waiting for someone to get in at like 37 K just <laughs> pulling for one, you know, I was, it was pretty cool. Um, what is your favorite part of nationals now? Not as a skier, as you know, someone with your role, someone who is BC during those four days, what's your favorite part? Just watching the teams on the shore. Honestly, seeing how excited they are and how much fun they're having. I mean, I can't tell you how many nationals I've gone to the last three or four years where I said, this is it for me. You know, because I love it, but, you know, you get older, you have a wife, you know, you know how many, you know, my weekends are already so tied up with ADSA that, you know, now you travel to college regionals and every year I got to go to nationals. So, you know, I've said to myself many times that, you know, this maybe it's time for me to move on. The board will I have full confidence that whoever steps in is going to do a good job. And every time I get to nationals, I sit there and I watch 300 people on the shoreline go nuts for a side slide. And I'm just like, this is, <laughs> this is what this it's is all it. about. I mean, how could I yeah. leave this? I don't want to, you know, I don't want to not be a part of this. It's just, it's all, it's, it's unexplainable. And every year it blows me away every year. Okay, you know, that's, that's a, that's a very cool scene. And even just thinking of like, my own experience is some of the reels that Marcus did in the last few years. When you just see the shore packed, it, it, it's just like we, we're not used to it in water skiing, really. Not yeah. anymore. Not anymore. Um, okay. Top three moments of nationals that you've witnessed since you've been president. And I'm talking skiing now. Man, you got to give me a preemptive questions here. <laughs> no, you know how this podcast rolls. We improvise. Top three national moments. Yeah. Could be team, could be individual skier, whatever you want. Whew. 
I'm not good at this on the spot stuff, Mateo. Uh, let's I'm see. sorry. That's okay. Um, there's so many of them. I'm trying to pick, trying to pick three here. Uh, Zach Warden's record. I mean, that was, I think that's up there. You know, everybody was yeah. waiting for that, wanting that one of the oldest records there. Uh, that's, that's, that's up there, you know, and it was at Bennett's, which is just, a such a perfect place for collegiate nationals with narrow Island in the middle. I mean, it just looks like there's 10,000 people there. Uh, everybody's swimming and it, you know, that's what I love about college too. The athletes, you know, they, everybody's swimming, right. Uh, You know, if you had that in ADB say, if there was one swimmer in the water near the jump landing, everybody would freak out. Oh my God, you're making rollers. And in college, you know, these are good skiers. I mean, you know, Zach Warden, Lauren Morgan, everybody, I mean, they, they obviously want good conditions, but that atmosphere takes over, you know, that stuff. So, uh, so yeah, Zach, Zach's jump, um, 19, 2006, I think Purdue hosted nationals at Paducah, Kentucky. That was when I think you might've been there. I don't know. Maybe that was before your time, but that was when the OL guys, uh, all I think all five of them jumped in the 170s. I think all five of them made the podium, at least four out of five. I know Dodd was there from Monroe, so I don't know if there was a tie. But they they made a tremendous comeback. All five jumpers jumped 170s, and they won by, I think, five points. Um, and I, I could be a little off on that story, but uh, that I remember that one. Yeah, 2005, they were down after – they were down before men's jump – they all needed to jump over 170. I mean, make to- the top, all five needed to make top seven or, or top six, something like that, and they did. So, yeah, that was that was pretty cool. I've heard legends about that one, yeah. When did you get there? Uh, I got there. My first Nationals was Bennett's 2007. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, you're, you're young. <laughs> oh, wow, thank you. I needed to hear that. I really needed to hear that. Okay, so that one, Zach. That one, Zach, and you need a third, huh? Let's see. Yeah, I need a third. I'm going to go with uh, 1997, Purdue hosting nationals. Uh, that I mean, obviously, it's dear to my heart as we hosted it, but it was, it was really, you know, we did, we did a lot of stuff that's never been done before. You know, we had a leaderboard. We had all kinds of activities, uh, you know, show skiing. Corey came up and did an exhibition and trick. Oh, uh, wow. We we uh, we had this we had this thing where every every cup you brought at the concession stand had a color on the bottom. So you see this do this at the NBA and stuff. So every cup had a color on the bottom, and then we had four tubers that went out at halftime, so to speak. And they each had a color tube, and they kind of played robo tuber to see who would you know, fall off. And if you had the winning cup, you know, you got a free pop. Uh, we did a ton of stuff that I think has never been done before. And it was, that was a moment where, you know, obviously you're working years and years to, to, to make this happen. And when you pull it off, I mean, literally had, you know, a half a lake filled, you know, two months before the event happened. Like I said, we worked around the clock to make it happen. And then it, it went off as, you know, at the time, you know, you hear one of the best collegiate nationals, to ever go down we we had it uh, on tv we had a production company there you know we just kind of went all out and so to be a part of that and and and, and see that happen that, that that's a that's a memorable moment for me you know yeah. by far well yeah you 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 get your your third one like this i, I at the end i asked your <laughs> three moments so this definitely oh. counts okay this definitely counts all right so before we get into awsa I was actually talking about this at dinner before recording the the episode. How is AWSA, USA water ski structured? Because it's it's an association, but then you have associations underneath it, each with its president. Is that is that how it is? It is, and this is like the number one question I get as president. It's amazing that nobody uh, understands the structure, and I don't mean that in the bad way. It just shows you how confusing it is. So yeah, USA Water Ski is the national governing body of water sports. So AWSA AWSA used to be the governing body and and underneath AWSA, and I don't even know if it was underneath, but in conjunction with AWSA was college and barefoot. I mean, those existed. 
And at somewhere in the late 90s, they decided that we're going to have USA water ski at the top of the tree and then all the sport distance right below it, you know, college and three events and barefoot and hydrofoil um, at the second level of the tier. So each of those organizations has their complete own board structure and bylaws and presidents. Um, so it's a it's a connect and a disconnect. You know, they are the governing body. And I don't know of any other sports that do that. I don't know if, you know, I don't think I think there's a USA snowboard in the USA you know, snow skiing as opposed to a, you know, upper level tier where snowboarding and snow skiing is below it. And I could be wrong. So I don't know any other sports that have that structure. Hopefully there is some out there, but that's really what it is. We are the three event division under the governing body of USA water sports. Okay. And the, and so I, I think what I, even though we are not Olympic, I mean, obviously you water skiing is at the Pan Am games, which is an Olympic event. So the governing body that, let's say, uh, responds or, 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 or communicates with the U.S. Olympic Committee is USA Water Ski. Yes. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah, they have, they have all, the, all the paid staff. They run, you know, the headquarters, uh, partnerships and marketing. They kind of do the bulk of, of all that stuff where the sport divisions then just kind of worry about the competition of their sport in general, their nationals, stuff like that. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Very different from, I guess, the other, at least I'm, I'm more familiar with the European scene here. It's federations. You have the board, the president and everything else. And then the disciplines are just yes, like underneath the same president, the same board member, the same council. Huh. Okay. And so you are now president of two associations. <laughs> underneath yes. underneath USA water ski. Okay. Correct. And you said you became president of AWSA in 2015. Yes. And you said there was pressure there. Go on. Uh you know, just pressure to take on that responsibility. Uh I did, you know, going back to 1998, like I said, my first steps in three event water skiing uh were I was on the skiers qualification committee. Uh, that became chair of that really quick. And once you're chair of a committee, that puts you in the boardroom. So now I'm, mm -hmm. now I am seeing more of, you know, what's going on with all the other committees and the EVPs. So I started really, you know, learning about, you know, the whole AWC structure. So I was in a lot of the meetings just as, as that committee chair. Then about 2006, seven, I became EVP of the Midwest region. You know, like you said, I kind of took that next step uh, of getting involved. So I ran the Midwest region for two or three years. And I kind of got out of it after that, um, as far as the bigger positions. I think I might have still been on skiers qualification. I don't even know. But uh, once I wasn't EVP, uh, I wasn't, you know, didn't have a position there. I was still kind of going to some of the meetings uh, just because you could, you know, as an honorary director. And I never thought I would want to be president. I mean, it's such a <laughs> intimidating job, kind of a thankless job. At least you, you think it is from the outside. It's not paid. You know, you're strictly a volunteer, but, you know, the sport in 2010 started declining, you know, if not before that. So you're going into these meetings and you're seeing, you know, a bunch of people trying, trying a lot of stuff. You're seeing the numbers go down. So naturally my instinct is I want to make it better. And I think, I don't know what it was about that board meeting in the summer. I mean, maybe I had thought about being president, but not very seriously. And I just got to a board meeting that summer. And I don't know what we were talking about. We were talking about division two nationals uh, in AWSA. And the whole room was just getting kind of, I don't know what it was. It just, I, I left that meeting and I said, all right, you know, this is, this is the bucket list item. This is the, you know, I, I'm ready to give this a run. I want to see what I can maybe do uh, to, to save the sport, so to speak. You know, obviously, you know, the wife was, was down with it, which is very important. <laughs> and it was yep. going to be a time commitment. And I just said, you know what, I want to, I want to give this a try because I, you know, I'm the type of person I don't want to, you know, later on regret not giving that a shot. And even though I could do it any time in my life, uh, I just, I don't know, I just felt like the right time. And, and I knew it was the odds of being a success were going to be slim. I knew I was going to take on probably the biggest challenge of my life. Cause I, you know, not to sound cocky, but I, I feel like I haven't failed it a lot in my life as far as when I set my goals. You know, we're going to host a tournament. It's going to be the best tournament 
we've ever had. We're going to host regionals. It's going to be the best. We're going to host nationals. Just, you know, that's just my, my personality, not to be, you know, arrogant or anything by any means. I just, that's how I approach anything. If I'm going to take out the garbage, I'm going to, I'm going to take it out better than anybody's taking it out. You know, it's just my, it's how I grew up. So, um, you know, I wanted to take that same attitude with, with presidency. It just, you know, I owe it to myself and, and, and maybe the organization to, to, to give it a try. And I just said, all right, I'm going to, I came out of that meeting in the summer. I remember I went to the banquet. I went up to uh, Jerry Jackson. I think that Jim Jake was who were super frustrated after that meeting. And I just said, listen, guys, I, you know, I'd like to run for president. Can I have your support? And they, they got excited about, you know, that, and it just, that kind of snowballed into uh, wanting to do it. And so it was a whole year after that. Uh, you know, I talked uh, to the current right. current president because the current president, Bob Mayhew, had just become president. And I didn't want to step on his toes or, or necessarily if he if he wasn't ready to step down, I didn't want to, you know, rub rough any feathers. I wasn't vice president at the time. I wasn't even a director. I kind of, like I said, I was I got up there, stepped back, and then you know, I wasn't really making those steps to take that up. And Bob Mayhew said to me, he said, if you if someone like you is, is ready to take this position, I will step as gladly step aside and, and let you take a run at it. So just kind of all those things combined. I, I said, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to give it a try. Wow. What a, what a noble thing to say, you know, like for him to say, you know, if someone like you is ready, I'll, I'll step down. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like I said, he had just, you know, you need a lot of years of presidency to, to, to put your plans in action. So, yeah. you know, so that, yeah, that was great of him to, to do that. do that. Yeah. And if I may say, like, I wonder if, you know, you, you said it's personality, obviously, you know, my background, but I wonder if it's just being exposed to someone who work in construction. Like to me, like, I know it's something silly, but like my parents are building a new home and occasionally I go to see the progress, you know, and the, the, conscientiousness that it's required to to build something is huge you know so i wonder if that exposed you you know like as you said if i'm, if I'm taking out the garbage i'm going to take it out perfectly if i decide to set this goal and, and give it a shot i'm going to give it the best shot i can possibly give um interesting yeah i think cool. i mean it's a it's an interesting analogy I, I think more it's just my parents in general i mean that's how they attack life uh, you know they they own a lot of you know, they're into their own businesses. So, you know, they always wanted to, to make it the best. They grew up as gymnastics coach. My dad was a football coach, you know, and he, you know, his football team was going to be the best. My mom's gymnastics team was going to be the best. So they, they had that attitude and I think it just kind of rubbed off on, on myself. Yeah. Two sports where you need a lot of hours on top of this gymnastics and football. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this interview with Jeff. So far, it's been a true pleasure and I found this really insightful interview uh, to be very much fun and I'm glad that I finally got to share it uh, with you guys. Now, about the break that I mentioned early on in the episode, I have an announcement. So I've decided in conjunction with World Water Skiers to organize a fun uh, online water ski tournament. I think what they're doing with the water ski games, if you haven't checked it out, go on worldwaterskiers.com and check it out. What they're doing with the, the water ski games is a phenomenal idea. There's great people behind it. The cause is good. Uh, it's really going to help promoting the sport and growing the sport. So also even getting people that don't really compete to compete. Something that um, Jeff and I talk about in the interview. So I've decided to help out and I'm organizing a tournament called Anything But A Slalom Ski. So you can go on worldwaterskiers.com and check out the rule for a class C. But essentially the rule of this contest that I've uh, come up with is you have to run the slalom course. You use zero buoy scoring. If you're not familiar with that, you'll find more um, instructions about that on worldwaterskiers.com. And interestingly enough, this is also something that Jeff pushed into AWSA. So a lot of connections between this announcement and the interview. In any case, uh, anything but a slalom ski is a contest where you'll have to post a video online following the rules of the water ski games. 
where you'll run the slalom course on anything but a slalom ski. So no tournament slalom ski, no free ride slalom ski, not cross course, not even big easy or overcraft. You can't run the slalom course on anything in which your feet are one in front of the other on the same line. Now that opens up to a lot of other boards. So trick ski, jump skis, combo skis, discus, wake skate, wakeboard, whatever you want, scurfer, the, the options are limitless. But as long as it's not a slalom ski that was designed to do the slalom course, then you're, you're game. Um, you'll find how to enter and all the details on worldwaterskiers.com starting tomorrow. So starting August 12th, you will find all the details on how to enter and how to join this uh, anything but a slalom ski tournament. Uh, what I may say so far is post those videos on Instagram after you've entered, you'll see the rules and uh, hashtag them anything but a slalom ski so that people can see them and we spread the word and we help out worldwaterskiers.com um, with their new tournament system, which I think is a brilliant idea. And why not doing a fun tournament to promote it? So there'll be more, descript- more details in the description below on the, on the podcast notes. But for the meantime, go on worldwaterskiers.com, get a profile if you don't have it, and uh, watch out for the Anything But A Slalom Ski Tournament organized by the Water Ski Podcast. Have fun, and I can't wait to see those videos. I'm assuming, you know, you decide to run for president, so there's an election, there's, vote, there's votes. Uh, how did that go for you? Well, nobody ever, there's, <laughs> nobody wants this job at tail. So okay. I, uh, in the 20 something years I've been in that room, I don't think I've ever experienced a, a quote unquote election. So I was the only nominee. So it went pretty, it went pretty, pretty easy. Smooth. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so that went easy, but it sounds like the commitment is huge. So can you give a sense to, to our listeners of like, what are your responsibilities? What, what do you have to do as president of AWSA? Well, the time commitment is, is absolutely insane, Mateo. I never, I never would have thought it would have been this much work for sure. I probably mm-hmm. do a good 20 to 30 hours a week just as president. And I already have you know, a job that I work 80 hours a week plus college and, and the site out here and family. So uh, it is it is way more work than I expected. I will say that. Um, now, I think a lot of that is because I'm doing a lot more than, you know, uh, is needed, you know, because I want to try everything. I have a long list. I mean, the first thing I did as president is, you know, did a lot of surveys, got a lot of feedback and came up with an 11 point plan and it's been my goal to implement that plan ever since. And I, I like to move fast. And so I, yes, I, I make it a lot more work because I'm trying to take on a lot of extra responsibilities that maybe the president doesn't necessarily have to do or always do. I mean, the responsibilities in general is, I mean, I don't even know if I could list them all, but you know, you know, first you have your, you have your committees, right? You have to, you know, fulfill your committees, get chairmen for them and make sure they're all doing their job. So a lot of it is just, you know, hey, don't forget, we need to work on this, keeping them involved, make sure you guys are working on this. So you have all your committees. I mean, there's rules committees, bylaws, skiers qualification, tow boat, drivers. I mean, there's probably 15 committees that are kind of underneath me. We're talking about that tree. You know, yeah. now they're under underneath me that you have to just constantly communicate with. And I want to communicate with, you know, I want to make sure, you know, we're all on the same page. So you have all the committees you got to run, you have all the bids you got to get, you know, we have to take care of, make sure there's the nationals, make sure there's, you know, Can-Ams, uh, make sure there's a junior S open. So, you know, you're soliciting bids. And even once you get those bids, there's a lot of work that goes into just communicating with them and making sure, you know, they're on, on spot. I, I, you know, there's a lot of work that I actually have to do for, nationals even though it's hosted by the LOC you're, you talk to them almost every day you know how's this going how's our vendor tents so there's there's a super amount of work that goes into that um just always something and then you just have the problems I mean to me that was this is the problems that arise are probably what really makes you want to quit 
you know, I don't mind, I don't mind doing the stuff that I'm supposed to do. I enjoy it. There's times when I love being president. I love being, you know, on top of it and, and seeing success. And then you just have those, those months where you have a driver that's been cheating or a grievance that's filed against you. Um, a problem arises. I mean, you know, just recently I did myself pulled elite points for the year. Yeah. So all of a sudden I got four tournaments in the U S that are very upset that, you know, they went out there and raised the money for the point. So it's like, it just seems like every day, every week, one. Some, something arises, something's wrong with the ranking list. My score is not right. Why don't you get, and, and I try to be a very transparent president. That's one of my goals. I want to be open about everything. I, if somebody calls me or emails me and they have a suggestion, even I'm the type of person that's not going to say, well, that's a dumb idea. I'm going to say, okay, I will send this to rules. And so I give everybody an opportunity, but that also causes a lot more work on my end because every day I'm just 50, 70 emails uh, centered around water skiing. So that just seems like there's always something going on, uh, good and bad, that just, like I said, it's it's 20 to 30 hours a week. Yeah, that's, that's no joke for something that you do voluntarily. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I know that in something like this, the successes are, you know, the sort of like, bodily recharge like you know stimulation to go uh why don't we start with that what what do you feel have been some of your successes in the last five years as far as awsa goes um good question uh you know because i go back and forth on you know how have i done grading myself and there's a part of me that feels like i failed i'm not gonna lie um because i set out those goals you know i wanted to quote unquote save the sport i wanted ten thousand members by now, and I think we had 7,000 when I started. So I set out the goals of having 10,000, and obviously that hasn't even come close. So there's a lot of me that feels like it's failed um, because, I, like I said, I don't, you know, I, everything I've done in my life, I feel like I've accomplished for the most part. And, you know, I definitely have not met my goals. So I go through phases of, you know, I failed and I didn't achieve it. But at the same time, you know, I, I talk myself out of that because I can look back on, you know, maybe just sustaining the sport has been a success. You know, when I started, we were losing 5% a year. And I'm happy to say the last three years, we've stayed the same. We've actually gained, you know, two or three members a year. Uh, I'd like to brag about a more growth, but I can consider it growth, right? Right, uh, right, right. So, you know, maybe in this day and age with this sport and, you know, how much it's gone down in so many levels. So maybe... The fact that it's stayed the same, you know, we track how many people are competing in tournaments that is not declined in three years. So part of me when I'm sleeping in bed wants to pat myself on the back like, you know, you did you did good because you at least didn't let the sport die more. But at the same time, I, you know, like I said, I, I wanted it to grow a lot more by now. And uh, there's a lot of challenges and we can get into those of, of why I think that's happened. So. It's, uh, you know, I don't know how I grade myself. You know, I, I know from an effort standpoint, I've done, I, I could feel good about, I've done everything I think I could. And I'm going to stay yeah. president. So I'm going to stay president until I've tried to do everything I set in that original 11 point plan. You know, I don't want to walk away without two or three of those not happening. So at least can see if it worked, uh, you know, whether whether that they'll succeed in growing the sport, I don't know. We've I've almost pretty much tried everything I can, to be quite honest. And it is what it is, I guess. I mean, it's a it's a tough sport, so. It is, it is, and and to me, it's really curious. Like, I mean, curious. Sorry, it's um, I'm I'm really excited to talk to you because I feel, although I don't have the response, the the institutional responsibilities that you have, that growing the sport has become almost like a, a life mission for me. You know, that's why I'm doing this. I'm organizing events. I'm, I'm teaching a kid to get out of the water. Like I'm trying to, to grow the sport. And I think it's probably amongst the most complex dynamic things I've ever tried to understand. Um, so when you say growing the sport, um, it seems to me you have a clearer picture of what that, that is, to you so can you explain me is it like more members for the associations like what is growing the sport in your mind well it's interesting you say that because i've often wondered if i am using the right metric because as president you only 
really seem to get judged on how many members do you have and how many tournaments are we having and how many people are skiing, right? That's your, it's your main metric. And from that standpoint, yeah, it's, it's not grown a ton. Uh, but you often wonder is, is, is success really just people out there doing the sport? That's really what I found to be a big challenge is there is a difference between are they out there buying skis? Are they out there still doing the sport versus competing? And my metrics have been maybe perhaps too targeted on how many people are competing. Of course, that's the only metrics I have. You know, I hear from ski companies that they are selling skis, you know, very well. I don't think they have seen the decline in ski sales that we have seen in membership decline, you know. So maybe as long as people are out there enjoying the sport and doing it, that hurdle to go from there to competition is such a big uh, hurdle, you know, uh, yeah. it's a whole different atmosphere. So, you know, I base it on membership because that's really what you can gauge on. It's what your funding is gauged on. It's kind of, you know, but maybe that's not the right metric. So, so from what you just said, I, I deduced that like membership equals I'm becoming a member because I want to compete or I am competing. There's, is there anyone that just becomes member of the association for the sake of, I don't know, the card or, you know, you know what I mean? That is our number one fail, Matteo. If we could, and we've been trying without success, but that is the problem with our organization right now is it is a, it is a need-based membership, not a want-based membership. So people mm-hmm. join because they need to. I want to go to this tournament. You tell me I have to buy this, so they buy it. Nobody wants to be a member. You know, so if they stop competing, they don't join. We're seeing it this year with COVID. You know, when I did the surveys and when I first became president, the most shocking stat I got, and we surveyed all the members that had expired in the last five years before I got there, and 85% of those people still water ski. So they're out there, they're out there skiing, but they're not competing. And we can talk and share ideas of why that is. So that's the problem with USA Water Ski Native say right now is that there is no perceived value in being a member unless you compete. People don't find the insurance to be a value and the magazine to be of enough value. There's nothing, you know, I have some magazines that I love so much I would never stop, you know, subscribing to them. You know, we don't have that with our magazine. So we've tried, you know, a lot of areas to do that with you know, discounts is probably the biggest thing we've tried to do, right? If there's anything in my mind that's going to tell a person or, or entice a person to still be a member if they're not competing is discounts on products, right? Bass Pro Shop, Bass Pro and uh, Hunting do a great job of this. You become a member, you get $200 in coupons. They feel like you're fighting for the right to carry a gun. And water skiing doesn't have that. We don't you know, we don't have a lot of waters weight advocacy where people feel like we're fighting for their right to, to keep them on public lakes and stuff like that. Um, and we have discounts. So I don't know if we're not advertising them well enough yet because you can get, I think, $100 off on a D3 ski. So if I'm someone out there not competing, but I'm buying a D3 every two years, to me, it's a no brainer for $19.95 to get $100 off of my ski. So, you know, that's an area where I think we could do a lot better. But Going back to your your statement is that's exactly our biggest issue. We are never going to get twenty thousand competing members. It's just not going to happen. I mean, even in the heyday of the sport, right, nineteen nineties, we're on ESPN, right? We couldn't be bigger. We still only had twenty five thousand members in all of Native State. I mean, it's more than we have now at fifteen, but it's not like we had four hundred thousand members even in our heyday. So, you know, but there is still tens and thousands of people out there enjoying the sport doing something behind a boat even if it's surfing you know they are not part of us and that's that's what's killing us if we can find that answer you know we will we could be okay with only having three thousand members because you're going to have a hundred thousand people paying 20 bucks to be part of it now all of a sudden you have millions of dollars that you can use to grow the sport and go back on public lakes whatever you think the right thing is but we don't have the income coming in to even do many projects that are really needed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's I can see that being a challenge because there, you you hear this conversation all the time, right? There's more people 
that water ski that we know of or that we are aware of. And and then he, as a skier like me and you and I, where we've been competing since a young age, it seems such a foreign idea, right? The skiers are the ones that I see, you know, that, that that's water skiing. It's a quality of the tournament I go to. But then, you know, just for this podcast, I've had emails of people saying, well, I haven't skied in 10 years. And then I heard your, I found your thing by accident and I became club member here and I bought a ski and I'm thinking about competing, you know, like, so there are, they are out there, you know, yeah. the challenge becomes, how do we get them involved in, in, in the association? Um, and I think this is a challenge that is not just American, it, it's worldwide within each country. Like, how do you get the skier that came to try today to be part of our federation? Um, right. It's not going to compete for a few years. And I think that's also one of the challenges we have in our sport is that the it takes years between being exposed to the sport and being somewhat able, eligible, call it whatever you want, to compete. Like yeah. to, to be to be able to cut and get a buoy, it's you have to have skid for a while, in a sense, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then even if you get that buoy, you know, to, to really get the courage up to to go ski in our tournaments is a whole nother level. Exactly. Exactly. So no, that's uh that's I think in the in the many ways in which you can tackle growth of the sport, like the with big G. Uh, certainly that seems to be a, an important aspect, you know, like getting the people that are not competing yet or maybe ever um, to, to be involved. And, you know, by the time this will be out, uh, my episode with Daniel will, will already be out. And Daniel is a skier from the U.S. that came to, to ski with us here in Italy who has been a skier for 20 years. Like he has been water skiing for 20 years. Uh, Guatemala, Jamaica. He has been skiing in the most beautiful bodies of water in the world and discovered about the slalom course two months ago, right? So, and like him, there's there's thousands, hundreds, who knows? But how do we get them? That's that's a, that's a very interesting question. Well, even, even kind of opposite that is there's also a ton of people out there that are running 35 off at home that have never gone to a tournament. They love the sport. They're buying skis. They're buying boats. But they just want to go out on a Saturday morning with their three or four buddies, get a set in, and then get to spend the rest of their day with their family and have a barbecue. And so there's, you know, there's there's that that huge group too. The ball, I call them the ball of sprayers, you know. They're right. on there talking about fit adjustments. And I mean, love the sport as much as you and I. And either A, you gotta find a way to make competition enticing enough for them which is tough or B right. at least we had to find a way for them to want to be a member, you know? Yeah. And that, those are two just tremendous challenges that we have not solved. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Like I'm thinking of our membership at our club. There's people going down the line, like cutting the rope that have never skied a tournament, but they enjoy, you know, the ski set it during lunch break at work and, and, and that's what they do. And how do you get them involved? Uh, other than you should go to a tournament or you should do this tournament we're doing here. Other than that, I think uh, we should be doing more. What that is, I, I honestly am not not so sure. Um, all right. But um, what are, so you said, you know, like you, you've been able to keep the sport alive, if I may say it that way. Um what else have you been able to do? Maybe even some more nitty gritty stuff, like not, not so, you know, overarching something you're proud of. Uh, yeah. Some of my, my wins, I'll call them. Uh, I think the number one win has actually been zero base scoring as oddly as that sounds. I, you know, zero base scoring is where you could shorten the rope before you get to your max speed. And I, I think it's probably the one thing we've done that I've seen used the most. I mean, every turn I go to, I see, you know, a half dozen to a dozen of the skiers use that to their advantage. So I think that's been a win. You know, has it grown the sport? I don't know. But has it kept a lot of people in? Absolutely. I mean, I've heard people say, you know what, I just love going 32 miles an hour. And they've literally stayed in the sport. I watch all these kids who don't want to go 36 yet stay at 34 and literally could have stayed in the sport. So I think zero-based scoring has been 
uh, probably our biggest big, biggest success so far. Yeah, um, which is which is interesting because I'll be honest with you, I was very resistant to the idea. You know, like to me, if you're above the age of 15 and you're a man, if you want to cut the line, you gotta cut it at 36 miles per hour. I was I was still very much like into this mindset. Um, but then, as you said, I did see how it kept people skiing, people that maybe, you know, a little overweight, a little old, but not old enough to cut a 32, you know, maybe an injury they could never recover and still nagging that they dropped the speed and they were still skiing good lines and they kept skiing. So no, like I must say I wasn't a believer, but now I, I really see the, the point in that, you know? Um, so good job on that. Yeah, so you know, zero base scoring has been good. Uh, I think the mini course, you know, not that, not that it got invented, you know, during my era, but the promotion of it, the the amount of courses that you know we kind of started it in college. And <laughs> it's funny, college has always been my kind of my test run. So you know, college did zero base scoring for a year before I did a say. So they did it because they're very open. Yeah, let's try it. I mean, I think we brought that up in a board meeting at the end. And it's like, here's an idea. And the board's like, all right, let's give it a go. I mean, that's what I love about the colleges is they, all right, we don't have to go through, you know, five bylaw changes and take three years to implement an idea. So anyways, you know, it started there. So the mini course started in college. Uh, I think that's been, you know, a minor success. I mean, like you said, slalom is hard. It is hard to get the one ball. So just having all these AWSA Class C sites at least have the green balls out there. To me, I have seen a lot of kids uh, stay in the sport once again because they're excited to get, you know, three green balls instead of just taking two years to get over to two ball in the big course. Um, mm -hmm. So I think mini course has been uh, a good success. Uh, we have the new junior divisions. Um, I'm excited for that. Uh, so we've gone to two-year increments. Uh, all the way up to 18 years old. Now, I got to tell you, the last thing I wanted to do was have more divisions. Uh, I think we have too many of them. But this is, once again, kind of one of those little changes that hopefully keeps kids in the sport. I've heard it from enough of, you know, 14-year-olds that quit because they don't want to see against a 17-year-old. And the hard part about that is our generation, we grew up, you know, we just didn't have that attitude. Our parents were like, well, you're going to go 36. And this is what we're doing, but it is a different day and age, you know, so you still have the old guard. That's like, you know, too bad, you know, get better, but sorry to say the younger kids, they don't get better. They go play soccer or video games. So uh, the new junior divisions, uh, I think it's too early to tell, but hopefully that'll be uh, something that helps as well. Uh, team skiing. Uh, that's something we started in ADVSA trying to piggyback off the college idea. Uh, I can't say that it's been as successful as I hoped, but once again, here's something little, you know, that I have seen people go to regionals and nationals that wouldn't have gone because they made the team and the excitement level of seeing somebody ski for the team and have that bid on, you know, it has definitely helped keep them in the sport. And, you know, th these are minor things. It's kind of like, you know, this, this helped 12 people here and 12 people there, but I think together, all of this is what's, you know, hopefully helped us maintain. So team skiing, I was hoping was going to be like college where we really got into it more. Um, and it, in some parts of the country, it, it's it's amazing. In Midwest regionals, the team skiing is just like college. It's off the right. charts. Everybody's got a bib. When their skiers up, they all run to the shore. So, you know, and in other regions, I think have not really got it to take on as much. So, you know, we're going to keep, keep trying with that. Uh, so that's been good. And I think the other thing I'm proud of is probably nationals, uh, kind of getting that back on track. Uh, when when I took over president, I think we were down about 550 skiers. Um, it was really starting to decline, and so that's been a that's been a good improvement. We had 720 skiers in Kansas in 2018, had the same amount again in 2019. So those are our largest numbers in 10 years for nationals. So I think that's been good. And we you know came up with the America's cup, which I think has helped do that a lot. I mean, you know, our pro skiers, when I grew up, they were all at nationals. I mean, that yeah. was one of the highlights of going, you had the U S open there. Uh, so to bring, bring some form of a pro tournament back to nationals, 
with a with combined with a couple other things, we changed the way. You know, nobody wanted to host nationals, and we couldn't find bids. People were bailing us out. Now we have two or three bids a year. We have the nationals all the way. The next one we're looking for is 2023 already. So just kind of changing wow. the format format of how it's hosted and what you have to do is so I, I'm I'm happy to you know see that kind of get fixed so to speak and, and come back so yeah I'd, I'd say those are kind of the top ones like I said nothing major in there it just feels like a little little bunch of band-aids that are you know we haven't really haven't hit that big that big game changer uh, yeah. yet and not sure I know what that is but I, I'm happy with all those little things I think they've helped help the sport here and there well and I would say that like skiers that are listening to this and I have a wide variety of, of of listenership, but I think a lot of the skiers that are listening to this are like, huh, that's interesting. Two divisions, juniors, or you know, mini course. Maybe I could implement one in my ski site. Like these are changes that, again, are going to take years to build up. I'm assuming, you know, like it, it, the idea comes maybe because someone raised their hand and said, hey, why don't we do this? And then you see, you know, 12, 24, 48. Uh, 72 no 76 etc you know like yeah you know like 96 but well, anyway <laughs> anyway you know hey it's 11 30 here p.m um oh, no I, I can see that those i mean it's a lot of you dub them small changes but I don't, I don't know that they're really that small you know like um no good i, I can see how you're proud of those um, I was I was gonna say level ten was one of my successes, but I don't know if that was. <laughs> That's probably been the most controversial thing I've done. Okay, so that that I'm interested in because after 13 years in the United States, I still don't know what that is. What are the levels? Like, can you explain them to me? Uh, all the levels in general. Yeah. See, what what's the what what is I mean, level six or five or seven? What what does that mean? Uh. Outside of it just being a percentile of the rankings, so the rankings will take everybody and say, all right, level eight is the top 25%, uh, level seven is the top 50. That's basically what the level breakdowns are. Okay. And then we use those levels for certain things. So most regions, you got to be level six to get to regionals. Okay. And then to get to nationals, you must be level eight. To ski open, you must be level nine. And then we implemented a level 10, which means once you get there, you have to ski open. Ah, because you could ski, uh, what is it, like men's two or women's one, something like that? Before, I mean, you you know, Nate Smith could ski in men's one if he wanted. Not that he did, um, but there was, you know, a lot of controversy over very elite skiers still skiing in their age group. You had a master's Ben that we created. So we had guys that were master's men and then they would hop back to men's four for nationals. So there was, you know, definitely this is one of those rules where you're either on one side or the other, you're a Republican or Democrat here. You either love it. And I've gotten plenty of email from people that, that thank, thank me for or not, not me, but thank you to say for implementing level 10. And I can't tell you how much hate mail I've had, over it as well. It's been a very controversial uh, rule change. Yeah, because there, like, you could be, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you could be 17 or 35 and ski open men if you have the, the levels, right? If you have the, if you are level nine, let's say. Yes. Okay. But certainly the 17 year old could have skied in boys four now, correct? Or in and the 35 could have given men's two or three, so that's like a open men and masters men or women. It's like the best of that speed. Am, am I understanding this correctly? Well, you can be any age for open. So, for example, Eric Elaine and Anna Gay, right? At the time that they were girls three, we didn't have a four and five. They were tricking 10,000, skiing the masters, winning the U.S. Open, and they would ski girls three at nationals. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of the big controversy. You have a lot of parents that go, what in the world are they doing in girls three? And then you have people that say, well, hey, they're the best 14, 18 year old in the country. That's where they should ski. It's a, it's it's one of those debates. But you can ski open at any age. OK, no, because the I'm thinking IWWF open is essentially after 21 years old and before um before over 35, right? 
Now you can ski open worlds at age 11 if you if you qualify or you make your national team, but it's always that sort of I don't know like. IWWF doesn't recognize a 22 to 30 year old age category or a so, 30 to 35. So what what if you're an amateur at the age of 25? Where do you ski in your country? Open. You ski open. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, you ski open. Uh, which I think just the term open makes more sense the way you guys are doing it. Um, but we don't. Yeah. The, after under 21, there's there's a big hole, like a big group. And then there's plus 36. So a lot of people that I know very well that, you know, classic story, started skiing late 20s, early 30s, are waiting to turn to go 36 because maybe they can cut the line, right? So did I lost you there for a second? You did for a second, but I got you. Okay. So it's it's... Yeah, we are, we only have this big group, 22 to 35, the same age. Interesting. So if you're if you're 22 and you can barely run the course, they have to ski against you. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, it's it's strange. Um, but all right. Um, yeah, no, it's it's something. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, they would have to ski against me. It's not right. <laughs> no, I, it isn't. It isn't. But then again, the numbers from 22 to 35 are so low that, right. you know, it almost doesn't even seem justifiable. At least now, if you look at the numbers to say, okay, let's do two or three age categories in, in, that we sandwich them in between under 21 and, and over 35 and see. Um, but that might, might keep some early 20s people in the sport i don't know i don't know it's it's complicated um well it's funny i mean it's you're right it's you know people want competition you know that's to me you know the number one thing they want so they in your scenario if somebody goes to ski against you they don't feel very competitive so do they do they go and get better or do they quit and then i look at college and i'm looking them and i always go back to this i'm like that person we all ski just men's slalom I mean, one yeah. buoy goes up against, you know, 41 off, and it, that's never been an issue. And I don't know if it's the scoring system, I think, is what kind of equalizes that out, or it's just I, – I don't know why it works there and it doesn't work anywhere else because you want to talk about the opposite of ability-based skiing. College is just all in one. But I think it's because you have a team that's going inside their head – they're battling for seventh through eleventh. So inside their head, even though they have to eventually, even their score, even though the scorebook is going to have, you know, Dane Meckler, you know, in it, they don't look like, oh my God, I got sixtieth. They look at, I got 110 team points, and Western Washington got this. So it's kind of these battles in the middle that I think makes it work in that yeah. atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. It's true. There, I think there is the team aspect is huge, right? So like your, you know, you your team knows that you can bring X. If you bring X plus a quarter of a buoy, who cares where you ranked? You know, like you brought that to your team is more than they expected. Uh, you, you who? You know, like that. That's what counts. Um. All right. Um. PBs. Let's change complete subject. Your current PBs. My current PB is, is four and a half at 39, uh, at 34. Okay. Uh, tricks is 46.60. Never been a good tricker. And jump is uh, 174 off the five and a half and 170. Uh, actually, 176 off five and a half and 174 off five foot. Okay. Okay. So are you, sorry, I'm going to talk IWWF now. Are you sure. over 36 or over 46? I am over 35. Sorry, over 35. For one more year. <laughs> for one more year. So you can still jump at five and a half. I can, but I don't. I have not jumped five and a half since I went into the 35s. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. I don't go any further. I I can still go in the 70s off five foot. I've had a couple of knee surgeries on top of it, um, but I, I I cut harder at five foot and can go really just as far as I could off five and a half. 
Okay. Yeah, no, that's what that's what I was asking. Um, nice. Well, those are those are high scores. I mean, over 170, almost down 40, like you know, 39. Nice. Thank you. No, that's that's high level skiing. Uh, have you skied? Like, have you ever represented the U.S.? I have at the Jack Travers Senior Worlds. That was my only time that I was a skier for the team for the for USA. Wow, wow! How do how was it? How was the experience? Uh, I mean, it was awesome. I mean, it's such a hard team to make because you're going up against. You're actually going up against not only your fellow 35 like Mark Shaw's and Brandy Nagels, right? Between genders, and you're also going against the other age groups. So they pick only eight skiers for that team. So that was a huge, huge accomplishment. That was very, very cool to do. Oh, okay, okay, because it's eight skiers across the age divisions. So it's a, it's the best male and female per age. So I mean, I pretty much got to be the number one male, which is super tough. Uh, and then so that's two, four, six of them, and then two others. We'll call them wild cards. Uh, out, out of any age group. Okay. Okay. Now I've made I've made a lot of Pan American teams for mm-hmm. the 35 plus, but that was my only world uh, team that I skied on. That's pretty cool. That, that I mean, that's that's the biggest stage, you know. Um, yeah. So that was that the worlds that Fred ran one at 43. I think so. Yeah. 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 Well, the other scores I remember the scores being super high there. Um, wow. I don't know. Uh, what, what did we talk about? What, what did we miss? What did we miss? Um, either my biggest accomplishment, or you said something about earlier, you're going to use my biggest memories of college and native say, but so I had my personal ones perhaps, and then could talk about what I think native say needs to do to, to make that change. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like that sounds like a big one we missed. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's let's do it. Which one do you want first? Uh, I want what AWSA needs to change. Because you um, did tell me the three ones in college. I did. Yeah. Oh, my favorite college moments. Yeah, you did. Yeah. No, I thought you were going to ask me my personal ones. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you started saying your personal ones, and then you you diverged into non-skiing uh. ones. <laughs> so we'll consider those three done. Let's go with one needs to change at AWSA. Uh, so I, I think it's my last year of presidency, by the way. Um, ah, okay. This will be my first public announcement on that. But uh, I think uh, I think I'm going to run this summer, and I think that's it for me. I think. <laughs> is it a um, yearly thing? Like you have to run a, every year? Yeah, it's only a one-year term, which is amazing. Ah. Um. But I think, you know, it's going to be six years. Like I said, it's just an insane amount of work. It has its ups and downs. So when it's up, you know, I'm into it. When it's down, I'm just like, what am I doing? Uh, but next year, you know, we're hosting, we're hosting regionals and nationals at my lake. I'm going to have a brand new baby, which we're naming Mateo, by the way. What? Yeah. Well, that's that's a big announcement. Yeah. With two T's or one T? One, one T, sorry. That's all right. That's all right. I'll take I'll take that. It's it's a good name anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I, cool. I think yeah, I just I you know, listen, I've been involved in this side of it for so long, you know, since I was eighteen, been on these boards and I think it's I think six years is enough. Uh yeah. And uh, you know, I'm gonna concentrate on being a dad and so so yeah, this is gonna be it for me one more year, I think. And you know, I I think the number one thing we could do in the sport, like I said, we've done a lot of little things, right? They've all worked. We haven't really found that big enchilada, that, mm-hmm. you know, the revamping it. You know, do we really look at this thing and change the entire way the sport operates? Because we didn't really get into it, but that problem with taking that person to competition is what our competitions are. You know, they're boring, they're long. They're two 12-hour days, 10-hour days. So if your whole family is not in, you know, if your kids aren't skiing, your wife's not really into it or somehow an official, I mean, talk about hard to, to convince that family, like, we're going to go, you know, we're going to drive three hours and 
sit in the sun all day and you know, hey if the kid if your kids make friends with everybody that always works out great right then they love it you know we call it the ski family you know that, and that's to me that's still the favorite part of every weekend is what we do at night you know just hanging out by the campfire and, and you know it's your family i mean the competition is is boring um so I think we got to find a way to make every weekend competitive. We have to stop skiing for just the score. You know, it works for perhaps you, you know, when I say you guys, the pros, because, you know, those scores determine a lot. They determine whether you're going to get into tournaments and make money and make a livelihood. Like it's a, it's a big deal. And yeah, the scores for, you know, for a lot of people determine how you get to nationals. And that's great. I mean, the, the ranking list has been great in a lot of ways because, Everybody's on it all the time. I think we could use a new ranking list. I think the problem with our ranking list is it's a personal best list almost. So since you only take two or three scores, I'm going to take my scores, for example, right? Let's say I average three or 39. If I go out on a weekend and I run two or 39, that's a, that's a huge score for me. I don't run 38 all, you know, all that much. So when I run 38, it's a big deal. And if I run two or 39, it's awesome. And if, my, if I already have a couple of threes, like that score did nothing. Like no incentive. It's not like golf where you have a point system or maybe who you beat. I think every score has got to mean something somehow. I don't know what the answer to that is, but I'm just thinking of some kind of revamped rankings that is more of a point system where maybe you take more scores into account. And I know that gets tough because you have the people who can't get to a lot of tournaments. So, you know, you've got to be fair to both sides. But I think if we can make, if we're going to keep skiing individually, Right. If we're all just going to go out there by ourselves and just your wife is on shore hoping you did good. Right. You know, those scores got to mean something. So, Jeff, you have more fans than your wife. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, when I say competition, you know, maybe a new regulus is the answer. I think handicapping is an absolute answer. I'm going to tell you about one tournament we have every summer. It's called the Green Lightning Team Tournament. OK, we've been okay. doing it since 98. Mateo, we have every summer, this is just a regular weekend tournament, 400 poles. We'll have 80 slalom skiers, 70 trickers, and 70 jumpers in A to B A, okay, on a weekend. And I'm turning away people left and right because we all ski against each other in a handicap. And a lot of people don't handicap, so, you know, we didn't invent anything here. But, you know, I think it takes the right handicap, you know, but to be able to, for everybody, this is competition. The problem is we have right now is we have no competition until we get to nationals or worlds. Even at the state regional level, because we have 34 divisions, you know, there's one or two people in it. So there's no competition there. And there's not even at the regional level for most people. So you got to wait till nationals to have competition. So that's not great. You know, I always thought to Freddie, you know, I'm envy of him that every weekend he goes to a tournament, he has full on competition. And we spend the entire summer just kind of racking up some scores and we wait for one tournament a year it's competition so we could implement some handicap and the great thing about it is you can still get your score you know right. on the side but every weekend has got to be fun it's got to be a return on investment if you are going to have somebody not only pay that entry fee but you know hotel room and spend that weekend and competition to me is, is that's it i mean that one ride i have in our tournament every year we're talking trash the nerves are there. I'm skiing against somebody who's not at my same rope length, but we're, you know, we're neck and neck. And we actually do it bracketed where it's head to head. So you move on the next round. And then every round you move on, you also gather team points. So it has a nice combination of, you know, a team aspect, but also the handicap. But it is, everybody says it's the most fun they ever have every weekend. And people would pay $400 to be in that tournament. Wow. So I, I, I don't want to hear how much entry fees are. It's yeah. about return on investment. Families will pay whatever it is if those kids and everybody had so much fun that weekend. So I think we have to find competition. Now, whether that competition is in a, in a handicap and a point system or ability based, and God forbid I say that, but that's probably the big matzo ball out there is, is it time for our sport to revamp all our divisions? Okay. And go to ability based because, you know, using your example, I mean, it's nobody should, nobody at 22 off should have to ski against you. I mean, no other no other sport does that. Yeah. You every yeah. you, you enter baseball, you're in league A, B, or C. You play hockey, you're ability based. Now, those sports have numbers that warrant it, so that helps, you know. But 
There's no reason that, you know, I'll take my wife, right? She can get three mini course buoys. And she goes to a tournament and because she's 30, between 35 and 44, she's got to ski against girls tricking 4,000 and going into 38 off only because they're the same age. That is killing us. Yeah, that's wrong. She, she's that's not going to go, she's not going to go in a tournament, you know? Yeah. So we need ability-based skiing. And one of these years, I hope to say tries it. Now, Barefoot just did it, and they kind of did a hybrid where the kids stayed by age, and then 18 to 55 is all ability-based. And then uh-huh. they go they go back to age after that because I have heard from plenty of older skiers that you have no idea what the difference is between 70 and 75. You know, they really feel that those age groups are needed, and then they don't want to ski against a kid just because they're both at 28 miles an hour. They're so I don't know. Right. Don't know what that, you know, exact ability base, but to me, that's the big thing that AWSA needs to try is a complete revamping of how we could be get away from the ranking list. We have all this technology that has come into play, you know, every weekend. It takes so much work to put on a record tournament. You got cameras everywhere. We have five people that count to six. You know, we've done all this stuff because we have to make sure that my score here equals your score over in Italy. You know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You just don't have that in snow skiing and golf. So that's my one dream. It, whether it happens during my tenure or the next president, or I want our membership to embrace that. And, and because I think that could be the game changer where now we have a lot of people that are on the sidelines that will start competing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so fascinating that you're saying this because I interviewed Candido Mott, who was the, TC of the World Federation, and he brought it to rankings and came to the same conclusion, but his view is a is kind of like almost the opposite to you. Like, and I don't know what I stand, and I'll explain this. Like, so until you are, let's say in 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 AWSA terms, at a certain level, level nine, level eight, whatever, um, but until you get to the level. It seems that for whatever reason, all you care about is those scores on the damn ranking. Like you want to see yourself go up or go down. Like you don't definitely don't want to see yourself going down, but certainly going up. And who who do I have to beat on the ranking? Even though I've never met this person, it's just a name that lives on the other side of the country, but they have a quarter of a buoy more average than I do. And and so you know, like you have that. And then he said, but someone like you, referring to me. You don't care what score you do. You have to beat X because you get more points because that goes, you know, that should equal money and, you know, livelihoods and whatnot. So, and so he said, because of that, we need to have an ability-based ranking, which is funny how the, I mean, and I'm trying to try to think about myself. Of course, if I ski two of 41 or three of 41 is a huge difference personally, but I'd rather get second with two of 41 than 17th with three. So I think it's, it, it isn't clear to me yet what, what side I stand. I don't even know that you have to stand on one side or the other, but like, do I care more about placements or scores? And someone that is at, you know, 32 miles per hour, 15 off, do they care more about placements or scores? I, I don't have a big grasp on that. It's interesting. Well, and, and if we have to stay with scores, I don't think it's the end of the world. If we can find a way for there to be, like I said, maybe points with it. So I think nothing wrong with a ranking list, but going back to what I was saying about how it just feels, it's just too stagnant. I think I have been in men's three slalom ranked between eight and 11 for 10 years mm-hmm. because I'm always going to average. But, you know, if I went out and have a bad tournament, I want to drop. Or if I have a, if I tie my PB, I want to move up more or maybe, you know, I, this has been brought to the board before regionals and nationals should be worth a lot more. You know, you go to nationals and score that score or win that person should be ranked number one the next year. That's how golf does it. That's how, you know, but for us, you don't even have to go to nationals and you're still ranked number one. So I think there's some, some minor adjustments to that, that I think could make it very exciting where, I'm going to want to go to the every weekend tournament and put a little pressure on myself. Even if I can't, even if I'm not there in some handicap system, there's only 30 of us, you know, I don't want to have to PB to, to move up and down the list. If that makes sense. I just think yeah, there's more no, to do with it. 
No, no, I agree. I agree. There's, I, I agree that there's too big of a disconnect between rankings and placements at competitions. Uh, I would certainly agree with that. Uh, and at any level, really, uh, from the young to the not so young, from the high level to the lower level, I, I agree. There is a big disconnect in that. Um, well, yeah, we did leave out a few things 20 minutes ago. <laughs> I'm glad we, we touched on them. Um, look, Jeff, as I, as I give chance to all my guests, anyone you feel like you want to thank? Uh, sure. Um, you know, obviously my parents wouldn't be here without them. They made me who I am and built the lakes out here to catapult my career. My wife, for sure, because she puts up with, I mean, to have a non-skiing wife to understand, you know, every night I'm answering phone calls and, and you know, in the office, deal with water ski stuff. I mean, she supports me like no other, goes to all these tournaments, you know, that aren't, you know, besides seeing her ski family are pretty boring. So for her, for sure. And there, there's some people that really, I wouldn't be here in the volunteer uh, aspect without them. Um, you know, Jim crew, uh, you know, when I first started getting, uh, involved with skiers qualification committee, you know, Mark Crone, uh, Bill Murbach, uh, Dave Clark, those people just really became my mentors on uh, getting involved in support. I mean, I worked with them all the time on the ranking, you know, we developed the ranking list together with Mark Crone. So, you know, Mark Crone and, and Dave Clark and those guys have been huge mentors to me on the volunteer side. Jim grew is, really got me involved and, and he was president. I mean, he's always been a good friend and we've gone to a lot of tournaments coaching together. You know, he really, you know, is the reason I've been able to coach the, the worlds, you know, he took me along the steps and got me involved in that. So Jim crew, it's been a big part of me, all my coaches, my you know, best friend Gabe coaches me every day and Jim Tranchita and Jill Smith. Uh, you know, it's nice to have coaches with you every day, the Picos family. I mean, they, you know, took me to another level on the water. There's a lot of them, but those are, you know, some people support that have really been a part of my life. Well, I'll take the opportunity as well to thank you for doing this. I'm glad we managed to do it. I know you're a busy man and I've been in the boat for way too much in the last three weeks. So I'm <laughs> glad we got to do this. Um, thank you so much. Thanks a ton, Mitchell. Have a good one.